Welcome back to Atrium Talks. Hi, Deepa. Hi, Bhagwan. Today, we are going to be talking about excellence for organizations. Last time, we talked about excellence for individuals. That's right. But for organizations, what does that mean? The equivalence of habits is culture for organizations, is it? So, culture is a term that is thrown around. Much bandied. Much bandied and it means different things. So, tell us more specifically, what is it that we are talking about when you talk about organization culture? I think a working definition is that it reflects how a company honors its mission. Mm -hmm. And it refers to the set of shared values and beliefs that employees in an organization hold. It's the invisible hand in decision making, right? So, uh, but what I find interesting, Bhagwan, is that culture is often defined in terms of outputs, uh -huh. like integrity, passion, teamwork and collaboration or some such. But I think it's worthwhile to think about culture in terms of the inputs that achieve or lead to those outputs, right? As an instrument that you wield in your organization, to drive and scale excellence. So the advantage of that is because that will give us some actual implementable levers to change the culture of that place. Yes, absolutely. So tell us about these inputs. I think the very first is how are you motivating your employees to come on board the cause that you seek to scale, the vision that you seek to scale uh, across your organization. Yeah. And there are two levers there, right? There's Beliefs, beliefs and there's behaviors. Okay. Right. So the idea of using beliefs to motivate employees to come on board is that you forge a deep emotional connection for your employees with the cause that you seek to scale and then commitment to behaviors will follow. Okay. Give me an example of how you actually inculcate those beliefs. Satya Nadella, when he came on board Microsoft, so until that point, the mission of Microsoft was a computer on every desk in every home. Which was Bill Gates. Which was Bill Gates. Nadella changed that to empower every person and every institution or organization on the planet to achieve more. You see, there's a, there's a deeper emotional connection that you can forge with the second one. And I think that's what changing beliefs is about. Um, similarly, in this book called Scaling Excellence, the authors talk about when you want people to adopt, for instance, wearing helmets, you can have in a cyclist who's yeah. suffered the perils of not wearing it, uh, talk about maybe a near-death experience or some such, which, you know, then it, people in the room form a connection with that story, and then that motivates change in behaviors. So it's not just a statistic that so many people die without helmet, but you actually have a person come yes, in yes. and tell his or her yes, story. Yes, yes. You know, the recent talk on purpose-driven leadership, identify what's the deep purpose your employees have connected to your vision, right? So that's about beliefs and then behaviors following. The second is about getting commitment to behaviors, which will ultimately influence change in beliefs. So you change behaviors first, yes, which in turn will force new beliefs. Correct. Fake okay. it, fake it, fake it till you make it. Fake it till you make it. Yes. Okay. Or, you know, uh, affirmations are a great example of this, right? When you, you affirm certain truths to yourself every day as a habit, uh, it changes your self-perception and self-belief. Uh, even with the cyclists, right? Uh, what we talked about, you make wearing helmets something fashionable, you make it a habit, and, you know, uh, ultimately the change in beliefs follow the commitment and behaviors. Okay. I can relate to the second one. You can, huh? Yeah, I was going to ask you, what so, do you relate to more? So, um, for example, yes. every morning I show up at work. Yes. And I think that's a habit that I cultivated many years at UCLA and continued at the ISB as well. And the advantage of that is when everybody has that habit, it creates. You come together as a community, there is more interaction, ideas are generated the research culture becomes better. Much stronger. So this is an example of creating a research culture at an academic institute. So one follow-on question that comes from that, Bhagwan, is where do you start with the propagation of these habits? Where does it all start? I think starts at the top. Hmm. And I'll give you an example from University of Chicago where I was a graduate student. The two senior most prominent professors there, Merton Miller, and Eugene Farmer, 
both of whom went on to get a Nobel Prize in economics, were there at work every day. Mm. At 8.30, you could see them in their office. Their office doors were open. Yeah, so incredible. as we walked past by, we saw Mert is in, Jean is in, and that created a culture amongst the junior faculty members also to show up to work every day. Yes. And for graduate students like me, this was the culture at Chicago. Yes, and, it's incredible. And yeah. for seminars, every Tuesday, 2 o'clock, the seminar started, and there was a U-shaped table, and Jean would be sitting in the front here, and Martin Miller would be sitting in the front here. That created a big impact on what the culture at Chicago was. Yes, I think, you know, for the CEO, uh, equivalently in an organization to exemplify the values of excellence that he or she seeks to propagate becomes very important, right? So I cannot create a data-driven analytical organization if I use very little data in my own decision-making. Yourself. Yes, right. it sends a message, a strong message to the contrary, to the rest of the organization, ultimately diluting the value of that message and the culture. I think it's important that it starts at the top, top. but it doesn't just stay there, yeah. right? It's important to create pockets of excellent habits throughout the organization, right? And I think this is, it's very important because I feel, and one way, one, one way of propagating pockets of excellence is human capital, yeah. right? Because the single most important decision that you can make is who do you appoint to mm -hmm. key positions in your right. organization? Right. And, uh, you know, if you, for instance, believe a culture of transparency and accountability is important, then you have to hire people who exemplify that values so that they can go out and hire more people and then you've created a culture, right? Otherwise, if you hire people who are agnostic to those values, they're going to hire more people who are agnostic. More like them as well. Yes, and then you end up diluting the culture of the organization. This is a really important point. Yeah. How to hire the people who exemplify the right value. But very few organizations, I find, Bhagwan, pay attention to it, right? You yeah. invest in systems, in process, in structures, in infrastructure, you know, in physical technology, infrastructure, exam, physical infrastructure. Not so much on hiring. With, not, with very little attention to the people or the social infrastructure that's going to utilize and deploy those resources. I think this requires a deeper discussion. Fair enough. We are going to devote a separate episode, episode to talent to management. To hire and retain the right people. Yes. So then yeah. what else do you think matters? Human capital is clearly one. What else matters? So one way to create this value throughout the organization is to make it explicit what those values are and let all your processes yes. and thinking do it in the right way. Yes. So an example that comes to mind is Amazon. Yes. The value, now yes. this is the right value for them, is customer centricity. Yes. So in all their meetings, whenever somebody brings in a new idea, the CEO, Jeff Bezos, asks that person, how is that going to help the ultimate customer? We are yes, yes. And that pervades through the entire organization. Yes. From researchers to people who are trying to yes. create products. Yes. Analogous example with Nadella, again, you know, from Microsoft, uh, when they said they want to create a learning organization with a growth mindset. Uh, it's true that after every meeting, there's a case study which says, he used to ask, so what did we learn? <clears throat> right? What was, uh, was this a growth mindset meeting or was it a fixed mindset meeting? So you're saying that value is embodied in processes, in systems, in just nudges and decisions that are made throughout the organization. That's right. And unlike the physical infrastructure, which by and large is static, the organization culture is dynamic. It keeps changing. The example you gave of Microsoft, with Bill Gates, it was a computer in every home. And over time, it changed. And with yes. Nadella, it changed to empowering every individual. Yes, so yes. Culture is a dynamic, evolving concept it's, that changes over time. Yes, it's a journey. It's not a destination, right? It's a point in time construct. And as the business environment evolves, your culture too must evolve, right? You, you start early, but you adapt to an ever-responsive uh, business environment. Thank you. Deepa. Thank you. Bhagwan. I would say have a fewer excellent people, but pay them more.